My first job was touring the country in, a, in an 80s hairband. How cool is that? I mean, the 80s was the best for music, wasn't it? And you know, as, as fun as it was being in a band like that, I actually learned some stuff too. And I think of these life lessons as, um, as uh, useful tips, uh, notes to self, if you will, about living a good life. I think you'll find them interesting. I grew up the oldest of four boys in Trenton, Michigan. We entered the school music system and all started on acoustic instruments like clarinet, piano, saxophone. I started on the trumpet. And uh, we eventually took private lessons. Everybody, by the way, in my house played a musical instrument except my mom. She played the radio. <laughs> we started taking private lessons and applied what we learned in the high school orchestra, the concert band, the marching band, the pep band, the pit band for the school musical. Um, but even that wasn't enough music for us. We started plugging in electric guitars and synthesizers. Before you knew it, the four Caruso brothers were playing 12 musical instruments. And that versatility got us a lot of invitations to perform. Now, this was way before auto-tune, before in-ear monitors, before TMI, OMG, and FOMO. In fact, this band of brothers was fearless about putting ourselves out there. We learned that attention was a form of currency, and we learned to use that currency to get compensated for doing what we loved. We played countless uh, cover songs at weddings and parties, and then we got on the nightclub circuit. I remember our first house gig was a, a tiny place in Allen Park, Michigan, just a tiny joint. And the owner of the club was an um, older man. He taught me a lot about negotiation. You see, back in the day, there were a lot of dance venues, and the people that booked rock acts liked to see a lot of people on the dance floor because if they were dancing, they were drinking, and if they were drinking, they were spending money. For you young people in the audience, this is before we referred to drinking as networking. <laughs> it was a fun place to be in, uh, at that time, and we really enjoyed ourselves. Um, you know, uh, we also, uh, at the nightclub scene, it was a perilous place to be. It was uh, bad decisions, booze, guns, fights. You know, you've been there, probably seen it. Um, so one of the things that we noticed was that um, when Joe, uh, my brother Joe got sick, unfortunately, at age 19, we thought we were ready to take off. My, we had original music, we had the whole package. My brother Dave wrote his senior class song as he, when he was a junior in high school. Pretty good. And um, we thought we were ready to take off, and my brother Joe got sick. And unfortunately, at age 19, he had cancer. Uh, and for two years, he fought for his life. This was a terrible time for the family. And um, we eventually came out of it. Joe was uh, announced with a clean bill of health, and it was time for us to have a green light. But it, we'll never know what happened as a result of those two years. It was an interesting time for us. So um, we invested in ourselves uh, because we knew that it would be good for us to uh, have some, uh, some kind of future for ourselves. We invested in studio time at a place called Superdisc in Detroit. And we slipped in at 4 a.m. after uh, George Clinton and the Funkadelics. It was, uh, it was an interesting time. Uh, and one of the things that we learned about that period of time was that it's really, really important to focus on family, to focus on friends, to appreciate things. Because if you don't, th th things start to fall apart for you. It's easy to get distracted in the music business. I think you probably have seen that with some celebrities. So we launched. And uh, we started on the road on the college circuit. And uh, for guys that without any resources, we got very resourceful. I remember rooting around in between the seats of the van for something called a dime to use in something called a payphone uh, because we had gotten lost using a, an early GPS tool called a map. <laughs> For you young people, maps were paper documents that settlers used to find trails and creek beds. <laughs> <laughs> so the nightclub business uh, treated us OK. We um, invested in ourselves and booked some studio time at this studio I told you about. We repurposed these records as uh, the recordings as recordings 
as vinyl records. This was vinyl the first time around. And, uh, and uh, we also noticed that there was a market for Caruso band merchandise. So we produced uh, keychains, and we produced t-shirts, and we had wristwatches. For you young people in the 80s, wristwatches, solitary function was to indicate the time of day. <laughs> and the fancy ones would show you the date. Ooh. <laughs> we, uh, we, about that time, uh, we were getting really good at the, the art of first impression. We got really good at the first three minutes, which is the length of a pop song. And we got really good at the first three seconds, which is the introduction to the pop song. We started to meet famous people. I remember being on the stage at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, we were just getting ready to play. The students were talking to us, and they said that an exciting British trio had just passed through and played on this stage the week before. The band was so new, they had to rent their musical instruments. Yeah, they were called the police. We met um, um, Mike Love of the Beach Boys, met him twice. Uh, we met the reggae band UB40, who smoked a lot of pot back then and probably don't remember. <laughs> and then things started to happen for us. We started to get really important, high-profile shows. We got a chance to work with Rick Springfield. This photograph is from the Kern Block here in Detroit. He was launching his massive hit, Jesse's Girl. Rick was leaving the soap opera General Hospital. Now, uh, for you young people... <laughs> General Hospital, the soap operas were episodic TV shows featuring sentimental storylines. <laughs> we also uh, did a short stint with Corey Hart, who wore his sunglasses at night. And we opened for the new kids on the block. And this is interesting. Yeah, what are you laughing for, man? <laughs> and this is interesting. The, the, the kid, we were the only band on the bill. The kids didn't have a band. They played and sang to pre-recorded dance track. Now, in this time period, I was getting a lot of confidence because I developed this thing. It's probably the most important thing I want to tell you today. I developed this I'm with the band mentality. And what I want to share with you is you don't have to be in a band to have this mentality, you know? Uh, when you have this, I, I, I had this I, I'm with the band mentality, I learned how to talk to anybody, anytime, about anything. It's a fantastic life skill, and I still enjoy it today. So um, what's changed since the 80s hairband days? Well, as a professional speaking coach, I still am paid to travel. I still sign autographs. But I've swapped out my groupies for better roadies. What's not changed since the 80s? Flight attendants still tell you how to fasten a seatbelt. People still leave instructions on how to do voicemail. And, uh, and guacamole is still 50 cents extra. Is that OK? You know, 40 years ago, even during the rough times, I never realized that the world was conspiring for me. And something like that is probably happening for you right now, even though you may not know it. I hope you've enjoyed my useful notes to self. And remember, life, there's a, there's a rhythm to life, right? It's got a great beat, and you can dance to it, baby.